Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Call to be branches in Christ's body. We yearn to be connected to the vine. Call to be mustard bushes offering shade to God's creatures. We search for places to plant the seeds of faith. Call to be growing with God in the midst of this world's painful questions. We seek God's nurturing presence. Good morning and welcome to Worship the Lord. I want to invite you to sing our opening hymn. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of our God is like. This is number 118, 118. And we are going to be singing only the first three verses. The kingdom of Lord, Lord God of all creation, we come to you from our storm-tossed lives to seek your peace. We come to you with our questions and uncertainties, our worries and anxieties. We come to you from our joy and our happiness, each emotion a part of who we are. Join me as we confess and hope together. Almighty God, Father, Mother, and Creator of us all, we confess that we have not lived into our potential. We have shied away from the gifts you have given us. We have thought ourselves too small or too weak. We have thought our resources too meager and the risk too great. Forgive us for not seeing ourselves the way you see us, as full embodied vessels of your love in this world, full of the Spirit. Renew in us your spirit of encouragement, wonder and joy, and send us forth into this world that desperately needs your love, peace, and justice. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God knows you. God knows everything about you. God made you in his image. God has filled your heart with good things, filled you with the spirit. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and God needs you in this world. Go share the good news by loving your neighbor as yourselves. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Sorry, Julian, <laughs> let us pray. God of all that is, 
You are not a faraway God who breezes in and out of our lives. You are a present God who shares every day with us. Help us to hear your words this morning in the way that you want them heard. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and our spirits to respond in eagerness to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Today, we're starting a new sermon series called Pictures of the Kingdom. We'll be looking at some of the parables that Jesus tells. Parables are word pictures. They give us a visual representation of a point that Jesus thought was really important. A deep truth that he feels that we need to understand. For instance, when we hear about the sower today throwing a seed out on a field, most of us will picture the sower. Maybe he has a burlap bag hanging off of his shoulder. I wonder if he wears a hat to shade his eyes from the sun. Maybe every so often he pulls off the hat and wipes his face of the sweat that is gathered there. Maybe you picture rows of furrowed ground prepared for the seeds that he is about to throw. These were everyday images to the audience that Jesus was speaking to. They could imagine the sower. The sower made sense to them. Perhaps in our world of driving to work or walking to our home office, our picking up food at a grocery store and working in air conditioned homes and buildings that we can hardly imagine these pictures. They are foreign to most of us, even if we have vegetable gardens in our backyard. But I refuse to believe that these parables aren't still speaking to us today. I challenge you in these weeks ahead to picture Jesus and picture the people that we hear about in these parables. Listen for the way that he uses these stories to teach us some of his deepest thoughts and hopes for us and for his kingdom. Hear now the word of God. Uh, Julian, that's not the correct verse. So I'm going to read it from my page. <laughs> uh, this week we're reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 to 32. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes out with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade. When I picture a sower, it brings to mind one of the many paintings by Vincent van Gogh. Did you know that he created over 30 paintings of sowers? Although none seem to be of the mustard tree specifically, in one of his paintings called the Mulberry Tree, the painting that was in our announcements this week, the tree does bear some similarities. The painting explodes with color. Blues and yellows and greens and browns in every hue and shade Van Gogh could imagine. There is this sense of light and fire and a riot of color when you look at the painting. The painting is alive. Van Gogh, a deeply spiritual man, wrote often to his brother Theo, and in his letter, he, letters he told Theo of the God he believed in, the one who had created the images that Van Gogh now recreated on canvas. Van Gogh was tortured by his thoughts and his emotions. 
In fact, this amazing painting, the mulberry tree was created when he was a resident in an institution. Van Gogh struggled his whole life with relationships, with finances, with selling only one painting in his whole lifetime. And he suffered with debilitating mental illness. And yet, through it all, we get some of the world's most amazing and vibrant paintings. Priceless canvases that hang in the best museums all over the world. Even with the artist's painful and lifelong struggles, he was still able to get a glimpse of God and through that glimpse, recreate an image of God's creation that would stir our hearts and bring us joy for so long. Van Gogh's kingdom images are a gift from God to us through this amazing artist. So now that I've given you a bit of an art history lesson, you may be wondering, what does all this have to do with the parables that we heard today? Stick with me. In the first parable, a gardener throws seeds and then goes to sleep. The seeds are left to fend for themselves. And then he sort of wakes up and there's the harvest right in front of him. He cuts it down and he moves along. That's crazy. One of the reasons I don't like gardening is that it requires so much work. Weeding and watering and fertilizing and pruning and tending and debugging and picking the fruits or the vegetables at the exact right moment, preferably before the chipmunks or rabbits or groundhogs or deer get at them. It's hardly a throw it in the ground and it takes care of itself sort of thing. It's actually a lot of personal investment. And if you think about it, this story seems ridiculous as parables often do. Jokes told to a humorless audience because most of the time we aren't laughing, the joke is actually on us. But these aren't your typical jokes. They are jokes meant to stretch us, to press on us, to make us uncomfortable, to make us look at God and the sacred differently. What is the kingdom of God like? The kingdom of God is like nothing we know or understand so much bigger and broader than our minds can imagine. I wonder, are we capable of being the gardener? The one who plants and then sleeps? The one who goes to bed and never second guesses his seeds, trusting that they will become exactly what they are supposed to become? I know that I'm not. I'm the one who plants the seeds, then goes to bed and lays awake half the night worrying about what the seeds are going to do. Then I get up early to check on the seeds. Are they still alive? Are they okay? I second guess myself constantly. I worry about what's going to happen, what I forget to do. But in this parable, the kingdom is not built on worry or piety or diligence or even really impressive prayers. It's based on trust and grace and God's hand. Trust that the seeds will do exactly what God intends them to do with or without my intervention or my worry. And furthermore, the stuff that is happening to the seed hidden deep underground is unknown to my eyes. It's just happening by the work of God's hand. There's a lack of predictability in these seeds. And in this same way, there's a lack of predictability in what God will do in our world. It's hard to trust God, to let go of trying to control things around us, to be at peace while God does his work in his own way. In the second parable, a sower scatters mustard seeds, which grow into huge shrubs and offer shade for the local birds. The joke lost on us in this parable is that the mustard would never have actually been planted in the time of Jesus. Back then, mustard was sort of like dandelion, something you lived with, but you certainly didn't plant on purpose. Unlike today when acres and acres of mustard seeds are planted in order to make things like mustard. Back then, mustard was hardly a condiment for your sandwich. 
I wonder what those listeners were thinking as Jesus spoke. Plant weeds? So they take over everything around us? So that there was no division between what was good and edible and what was invasive and useless? You can begin to see why these parables seem like jokes to the listeners. Crazy, make no sense, confusing jokes. I think when we hear a parable, we often sort of scratch our head and put on a face of understanding when really we find them rather baffling. On our best days, we may walk away and a couple days later get a bit of a niggling feeling at what Jesus may have meant, at least a little bit. But mostly, I'm not sure we ever really fully understand these stories. So what do you think about this one? This parable about a tiny mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like this little seed that grows into a big weed. Something little can become something amazing. Something ugly can be something beautiful. Something tame can be something wild. At least it can to God. Could that mean that the ugliest and smallest and most insignificant parts of us could possibly matter to God? That God looks on the weeds of our life and actually sees something holy and beautiful and redeemable and possible? I don't know one church. Could that mean that the person that we find insignificant, that person that we have no time for or energy for or love for is everything to God? God's kingdom is wild and untamed and invasive, whether we like it or not. God's kingdom spreads and grows, whether we are a willing participant or not. And those birds that nest in the weeds, well, at our, at our house, the birds can be beautiful and their songs can be lovely, but they also can be destructive, leaving messes, eating what we have worked to grow, all those blueberries plucked away. It's hard to accept birds and people for who they are, not who we want them to be, not acting how we want them to act, saying what we want them to say, not practicing faith in the ways that we agree with or the ways that we practice our faith. Well, God doesn't push any of us out, even the ones who aren't easy to get along with, the ones who act differently than us, or the ones that aren't even very kind, or the ones that cause a huge mess in our lives. It turns out the earth isn't ours for the taking, but rather God's precious creation used for God's purposes. His creation is for all of his people and for all of his creatures, even the ones that we struggle with. It turns out God loves us all. It turns out the kingdom of God isn't at all the way we thought it would be. <clears throat> It isn't safe and easy and explainable and ours. We don't get to control it and make it what we want. God's kingdom is just that, God. And so we throw seeds out, risking that we might not always be comfortable with what they produce, remembering that our job is simply to toss and to wait and to hope, accepting God's hand and purpose and the fruits that those seeds produce namely the fruits of our days and our lives, accepting that whatever grows is of God. Van Gogh, like a mustard seed, may have looked as though he was not capable of such amazing beauty, broken and battered as he was, but God knew differently. He knew Van Gogh was capable of breathtaking beauty and light. He knew that Van Gogh could create a piece of God's creation on a canvas. Mustard seeds start small and grow beyond expectation. There is so much in our world that we think we have figured out and then God goes and surprises us. <clears throat> Reminding us that his vision is so much bigger than ours, even in our most imaginative state. This unexpected transformation is evident in Jesus Christ. 
from an immigrant baby to a carpenter, to a hated criminal, to the moment when we realize that through this man, this God, salvation and transformation would come. The world would be turned upside down and brought to rights. The people of his creation saved through him in a way that we never, ever could have anticipated. <clears throat> Like the mustard seeds, Jesus is hard to predict and understand and impossible to manage. So God's kingdom is more than something tiny that grows into something huge. It's more than something ugly that grows into something beautiful. And those are easy things to accept about God in many ways. The hard part is how unpredictable, invasive, otherworldly, wild, and out of control God's kingdom is. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. That sounds so gentle and small, and I assure you it's not. When Jesus uses these everyday images and people and stories to describe a huge idea, he is challenging us to think and wonder and consider how this comparison is true. Parables are not something to simply get. They are something that pushes us to be uncomfortable and challenged and maybe even wrong. This sower and mustard seed may be saying something to you today that you do or do not want to hear. Listen to those nudges. God is pushing on you. And next year, you may hear this parable and think something completely different and that will be awesome. That's the beauty of God's living words for our life. God is well aware that we can't handle his kingdom all at once. So we understand it in small bits, in little moments, one mustard seed at a time. The only thing I can say with full assurance, without the shadow of a doubt, is that God is saying something and it's important that we hear it. Whether it's small or big, ugly or beautiful, tame or wild. It's something that he wants to say. And it's something we need to hear. Neither you nor I can control God or what he does any more than we can control a mustard seed growing wild and free in God's world. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we are afraid to risk. We are afraid what might grow out of our efforts. Why is it we can't trust that you are watching over it all? That you can take something small and insignificant and make it into something amazing and beautiful. Help us to trust, to know, and to see your hand as it forms your kingdom. Amen. Can you join me now in our affirmation of faith? is Christ whom we proclaim. The image of God, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, the beginning and the end, the reconciler of all things, the peacemaker of the cross, the hope and mystery of glory. It is Christ whom we proclaim.
now, dear God, we join together in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And for a closing hymn, I want to invite you to sing, O Word of God Incarnate. This is um, number 757, 757, in your hymnals. And we are going to be singing all three verses. for worshiping with us. We'll be gathering after um, after the benediction and the postlude for a time of fellowship and uh, hear about some of our students and what they'll be doing in the next year. But now as you go out into the world, know that you are held and loved by an amazing God. Know that his kingdom includes you, every one of you, every one of us in this world, for his love and grace extends to us all. Amen and amen. Please remember to express your gratitude to God by supporting Six Mile Run with your time, talent, and treasure. Your offering is gratefully accepted on our website at www.sixmilerun.org using the giving button on our homepage, or by mail to the church building at 3037 State Route 27, Franklin Park, New Jersey. Just a reminder that this summer we will gather both at 8.30 a.m. for in-person worship in the sanctuary and at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Sermon Discussion Circle will resume this Monday at 11 a.m. via Zoom. Join us as we explore today's sermon in more depth. Today, we recognize the 2021 Koroyu Sinkak Scholarship recipients. 
Finian Mayer. Sydney Botnick. And the rest of our scholarship recipients listed here. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more Six Mile Run content.